The news is here. Very important four words that we heard from this judge presiding over Donald Trump's criminal trial. We have our jury. That's today, and it's actually faster than many expected, and we'll get into why, but those words have legal force. It's not an observation, it's not a commentary, it's not an op-ed in a newspaper about the trial. It is the presiding judge formalizing that they have gone through the process with total fairness to the defendant, even losing some jurors, which I can tell you about today as well, but we have our jury. That's after just three days of jury selection. Twelve New Yorkers are now on this jury sworn in to decide the fate of Donald Trump. And I can tell you as a legal fact that these 12 people will hear the evidence and then make a decision. And if one of them becomes somehow unavailable or unable to continue their duties, an alternate will step up into that box of 12 and continue on. There are precedents and practices here, which is why they have substitutes. They've been through this before. It's not just 12, and if somebody goes away, it falls apart. Indeed, tomorrow, they're going to pick the rest of these alternates for however long that takes, a day or two or three, but it shouldn't take all that long on this pace. Five women, seven men in the 12. We do know their professions, an investment banker, a speech therapist, an engineer. And for privacy and legal reasons, we're not disclosing additional information about these individuals. That's why, as well, you see, obviously, anonymous jurors here up on the screen. Now, they were selected out of a pool that could get as large as it needed, but initially began with about 200 New Yorkers who went through the first phase of this process. The defendant looked on as these jurors were questioned and challenged about anything that could create the kind of bias or impartiality that would have them removed. Now, today also began with a bit of a shakeup because two people who were just recently this week seated as jurors were dismissed, each for different reasons. The DA, that's the prosecution side, raised questions about how one had a prior arrest. We'll return to that. Today alone, half of the 96 potential jurors were excused after acknowledging they could not be impartial. Now, we have word on one of them. A reporter caught up with two of them, actually, outside the courthouse. It's a historical case, and, you know, this is going to define so many things. Um, but at the same time, our job as a juror, right, is to be impartial, like to be unbiased. There's no way after my online presence um, where I've satirized this man again and again that I would be fit to, they would regard me as, as to be fit to serve. That's one New Yorker saying that he satirized Donald Trump online. That's public. The Internet lives forever, if you've heard the term. And so now, in what is certainly an unforeseeable surprise event for him, if you told that man or any of these jurors probably in, say, 2017, that what you're typing right now in the middle of the night or in frustration or in reaction to the world's news will be used against you in a court of law, so to speak, not, not to say that you're a criminal, but to say that you're not fit for the jury. As he said, they could not consider him impartial based on what he had written, said, and implied about Donald Trump online. And that is as it should be. If someone has so publicly or vehemently committed to a position or a criticism that is adverse to impartiality in this process, then they're not the one. They only need 12 jurors and a couple more alternates, as I mentioned. So they can afford to be very picky. And that is, again, in fairness to the defendant, because the burden is on the prosecution. The jurors answered the same 40-plus questions, including whether they'd ever attended a Trump rally, read his books, listened to Michael Cohen's podcast. A jury who was a juror candidate who was not selected was asked if conversations with coworkers about this very case could influence her. And she first said she could try to be fair, but she also said this, which you see on your screen, quote, it is hard to unring a bell. In other words... She'd try to be fair, but the bell had been rung on her views on this case, and so she was also not picked. Another juror, though, today was, ex was dismissed because having been sworn in and then tasting or having a little bit of the kind of public reaction that you can get, even if you're imagining it because you say, well, I'm one of the jurors, or people around you start to bring things up, they may or may not know you're a juror, but all that just in week one from all the media made her say she was concerned about continuing on and concerned about her and her family's safety. She told the court, I have concerns now. The aspects of my identity have already been out there in public. I had friends, colleagues, and family push things to my phone regarding questioning my identity 
as a juror. I want to be very careful here. That is her view. You might call it her subjective experience or her opinion. You could imagine a different person in New York being asked, are you a juror because of information out there? And that doesn't mean they're in danger. It just means people are all processing some of the same information. Having said that, as fairly as I can, there is a context to this, and it is concerning. Her dismissal came after these kind of statements and coverage, which may be protected by the First Amendment, but still has repercussions about this new jury. She gets her news from the New York Times, Google, and CNN. She said two things that really stuck out. One, quote, I don't really have an opinion of Trump. And, quote, no one is above the law. I'm not so sure about juror number two. The fate of a billionaire real estate tycoon, TV celebrity turned 45th president of the United States is in the hands of New York City lawyers, teachers, and Disney workers who like to dance and get their news from the Times. But swear they can be impartial. That is that individual, that member of the media's view. Now, there's nothing in that clip I just showed you that is illegal or that would be suppressed. It might be disagreeable, it might be misleading, and it might, combined with other things, create an environment that is undermining rather than supporting a fair and impartial process. And by the way, that's hypocritical because if those folks are so concerned about this process, they should want a fair, reasoned, sober one so that we get to the right answer, which could be the acquittal of these charges, right? That's what a fair process could result in. But if you notice, I'm being very careful. It's for a reason. No law was broken with that commentary. And there are people who are going to weigh in on this trial, including various aspects of the process and the jurors. Now, the judge decides the law in this case, and the jury decides the facts. And so I'm going to read to you what the judge said today for further context. Quote, we just lost what would have been a very good juror for this case, she said she was afraid and intimidated by the press. So that's the lay of the land. The judge has now tightened restrictions even further on different things that the press can report about prospective jurors. But again, the fact that a member of the media, in that case, a Fox News anchor, used that information the way he chose to doesn't resolve the tougher questions here, because you can restrict certain information in the court, certainly for safety, certainly for the jurors' anonymity, but this is still going to be a freewheeling debate, and people are going to say things about this trial, and there has to be First Amendment protection for that. And as I've told you before, that means including and especially the things you disagree with, not just the things you agree with. So that's what the judge said. I told you the other thing. Prosecutors also allege that Donald Trump has been violating his gag order that came up earlier this week. They now cite seven other instances, including Trump posting online with a quote from that Fox host I just showed you, saying that liberal activists were also somehow lying to get on the jury. Now, Trump is sort of using Fox in a dance to try to get away with saying things. And let me be very clear. Trump, the defendant, is not like just some freewheeling member of the press. He already has restrictions, including a gag order. So it's very different when he does things about the jury or witnesses than others. For example, on this program, we are going to discuss and even at times fact check the witnesses. We can do that. The defendant can. And the prosecutor said that post that I'm leaving up on the screen there was the most disturbing post, especially in light of what happened this morning. A Trump's defense lawyer say, quote, none of that established that there's a willful violation. In fact, it brings to light some of the ambiguities of the gag order that I mentioned. Now, here's what the gag order states. The defendant, Trump, is directed to refrain from making or directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. So, if you want me to boil it down, you say, okay, Ari, this seems like it's getting a little detailed and technical. Yeah, well, it is technical. We're talking about very specific trial rules. If you want to boil it down, the anchor probably was fine making that statement. I certainly don't think there's going to be a case open about it. And the defendant, based on the plain text of the gag order, probably was not. That's the legal issue. Again, separate from the opinion of you can criticize both statements. But Trump trying to hide behind the media and saying, oh, I'm just retweeting, I'm just reposting. No, you're doing it. 
And the gag order very clearly, very clearly says you can't talk about these jurors or prospective jurors. Now, the judge did not rule on this. There is a previously scheduled hearing Tuesday on the gag order, and we expect all of this stuff, these new clashes, to be included in that hearing. Nothing about this is very typical, although the precedents and the rules apply. It's a high-profile case. A former president is the defendant. And all of this shows the kind of challenges we're up against. With that in mind, there are aspects of this that are legal, that are legal-specific to New York, but that are also public and political. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.